Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming uh, to listen to us on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this um, panel is about architectural education and its uh, future prospects. And um, we have three distinguished speakers here that I barely said hi to, so hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I will start from my uh, first left here. Uh, Dr. Shirin Samah, she teaches at uh, Dar al-Hikmah University and uh, she studied architecture at Cairo University in Cambridge, UK and got her PhD from Cairo University in uh, architecture and sustainability. In the middle, Dr. Sumaya Suleiman, who is now the Dean of the College of Design at Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University in Damam, which is the University of Damam previously. Uh, Dr. Sumeya is also an architect and uh, she um, conducts research on architecture versus society for the most part. And uh, she studied architecture at King Faisal University and uh, got her PhD in architecture also from um, University of Newcastle. And last but not least, of course, uh, Dr. Ziad Adam, who comes with an extensive experience in industry, in government, and education. He is now a professor at Effet University in Jeddah. He studied architecture at Cornell and uh, got his MBA on the way to Saudi Arabia from the European University in uh, Paris, and did his PhD at Cardiff in space syntax method, which is a mystery to me. Um, the theme of the, of the panel, can I have the, does this work? Yeah. I'm sure you know all these architects from your theory and history courses. Uh, Ando, Zomtor, Corbusier, definitely Buckminster Fuller. They have been active learners in their own way. They must have had some inspiring mentors they definitely uh, pursued a context which enabled them to actually excel uh, beyond, uh, I mean, to excel their own potential and become so well known. And each one of our panelists here will address one of these issues, um, either you know, a student as an active learner or a teacher or the context, either individually or collectively, uh, in their own presentations, and it pleases me now to um, uh, invite Dr. Shirin to tell us all the secrets about her experience with live projects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Atif. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Merkaz uh, Abdurrahman Sudairi. Uh, of course, the Dar al Alum Initiative, um, King Faisal University, and the special thanks go to Mr. Wahir Sudiri who invited me for this talk today. Uh, also, I want to thank Dr. Ziad uh, Samaya. It's really nice to be among the panel with you today. Uh, I wanted. Um, okay, my name is Shreen Samah has out of uh, introduced me, and today I'm going to talk to you briefly, very much about uh, my experience in life projects uh, through my academic years. Um, life projects have been part of my work since I was an undergrad. Uh, as an undergrad in Cairo University, um, I was part of a batch of 200 students doing the same batch in architecture. So, of course, the university had to utilize this superpower under their hands and divide us into groups that do lots of community projects. Even through, uh, after graduation, doing masters, two masters, and through my PhD, I made sure that I'm always involved in um, live projects because I always believe that it uh, relates or fills the gap between theory and practice. Uh, when I graduated and decided to take academia as a career, and then I decided to involve the same theory, use and utilize lots of live projects into my teaching. And uh, I wanted to just reflect quickly about why I chose academia. Um, I found that academia gives you the passion to give back. Uh, you learn not only for yourself, you give back, you give more than you take, but don't underestimate the power that you take back. You take a lot from those students, you take energy, you take, you're all, they, they give you lots of energy, they always keep you uh, uh, wanting to learn more, giving you lots uh, 
of passion about the topics you want to know because you cannot teach unless you know a lot about the topic you're teaching and keeping all the knowledge of the cutting edge knowledge available so that you can pass it on. Okay, I was able to do lots of uh, life projects, alhamdulillah, not only uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia or in Egypt uh, where I studied, I also studied in the UK and I also did a uh, fair of uh, project in uh, Colorado in the US. However, before I start talking in general about life project, as I told you, my experience started as an undergrad. And my turning point in life project started uh, as an undergrad in an urban design class where we were, again, 200 students, as we said, and they decided to divide us into 20 groups of 10 students each. Uh, my group went to Manil Shiha, which was a, a small neighborhood uh, full of slums in Giza and Egypt. And uh, as you see here, in this, the Nile was very close to these slums, which means that we have the opposites. We have very rich people living very high uh, land prices. And on the other side, uh, Manuel Shiha, which has, uh, had a population of 9,000 people living in very uh, deteriorated living conditions. When we went there as a student, we were shocked. You know, we come from a pampered society, so we go there and we uh, see those deteriorated houses, the conditions that the people lived in. They didn't have even clean water uh, for usage. They had to buy their water from these cars, and these barrels cost around 10 uh, Egyptian pounds per day. That's a lot for a family. Can you imagine, they, they use one per day, so for them, uh, 300 pounds was uh, a huge amount of money to pay. My experience in Smali and Shiha, we looked into the deteriorated conditions, the house structure, everything. And for the first time, um, I learned my first lesson as a student. I learned and uh, it reminded me why I wanted to be an architect, the, that I can have a value. My work, even as a student, can have an impact and that I can have this impact to benefit uh, my community and benefit people who are unprivileged. Um, I even uh, later wrote a paper. Uh, there was a very famous book called Collapsed by Jared Diamond, a book that I highly recommend uh, you to read about sustainability, which was a topic that we were just discussing a bit earlier, where Jared Diamond decided that there are seven major factors that affect the societies and cause them to collapse. However, when we looked at Egyptian slums, you will see and you will wonder why are these societies not collapsing? There is some sort of resilience that you need to admire in these slums. Um, so, when I decided uh, to become a teacher and go to academia, I decided to pass the same concept to my students and I decided to involve them in lots of life projects. Why life projects? Because I think these two quotes uh, experience or express exactly why life projects are important. First of all, the things taught in schools are just a means of education. The real education comes later with experience. The second thing is that um, what we have forgotten in school, you know, later on, the experience that we come and remember in school are the things that you pass on. You might uh, forget, you know, a project that you've done, but you'll not for, uh, forget an impact that you have made if you have uh, been involved in community projects. So uh, now I'm going to share with you very briefly student life projects and the sort of project we've been involved in. Uh, since I joined Dar al Hikma five years ago, we were able to uh, start with, for example, there was the Hikayat Ashara project. That was uh, exactly a project where we selected or we chose 10 uh, ladies from a Ruiz district, which is very, un uh, yani de deteriorating again, a district in uh, Jeddah. And we decided to make them or document the neighborhood using their lenses and their cameras. So the graphic design department and Dar al Hikma worked with this, uh, <clears throat> uh, these ladies to make sure that they document this area of Ruiz. However, what, the, what, does, what do uh, my role as an architect uh, do with this? So, uh, since we are in the same school, the architecture design, uh, design school decided to utilize us and use uh, some of our students to design the exhibition for uh, the ladies. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, we asked the students, these were uh, very, <coughs> these were, I think, sophomores and very junior students and they were uh, young students and we decided to ask them to design, you know, the booths where the ladies will present their work and they didn't only just design the booths, the, the students also got involved in building 
the booths themselves. And that was a huge experience for them. They were so passionate about it, they felt the difference. And it was a, a very successful event. Uh, so they learned that, you know, even as a student, you have an impact, as I said before, and you can uh, get in touch with your local community. Another project was Babel Bond project, uh, which is a, a historical building in Jeddah again. And we decided to ask the students, they wanted to make Babel Bond into a museum. And we again asked the students, you know, to take a project, you know, of an existing building, not to change anything in the building from the outside, but how they can utilize it and change it into a museum from the inside. Again, uh, we, when you're working with young designers, you know, they want to change the world. How, can, how come you can work with a building that's already existing? Uh, how will we learn? What will we learn? We want to design, we want to take it down and build a new building. But we asked them, again, not to take or change anything in the exterior, but just to fit a museum or the use of a museum inside the project. And that's what they did exactly and was, again, a very successful uh, project in uh, teaching them how to reinvent their history. Uh, an Asir project we did in fall 2015, uh, where we also uh, worked with the Ministry of uh, Tourism, and we wanted, uh, you know, to raise awareness about the village of Asir. And the students had uh, a very great time doing this project because they got to visit Asir, work with the locals and uh, they got introduced to lots of the events there and it was a very, another very successful project. We did lots of other projects. We did, for example, a live project as a competition. For example, we did a compound in Jeddah where the designer, you know, selected the winning design and decided to execute it. The st students get to go to the site, design it and do all the way to executive drawings. Uh, another project we did in Colorado was the UBISC Theater, where a client had a land and decided that they want a music center and they wanted the students uh, to work on a, a music center or a theater. And again, the winning project was the one selected by the client. We also worked on small projects like a British uh, consulate in Jeddah pool house. Uh, and our last project was a research project was uh, Jawahir Nara Al Arum research project, which brought me to you today and to after this talk. Um, <clears throat> overall, I want to conclude my, uh, my talk saying that life project helped our students a lot. It helped me a lot as an undergrad and it still helped me a lot as an academic. It uh, brings experience, value and impact to the work of students. And I think that, you know, in the creativ uh, creativity industry where we are, the worries, the uncertainties, it's what uh, makes it worth it in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shirin, for finishing on time, exactly, spot on. Um, I should have said that um, the first design program for women in Saudi Arabia was established at King Faisal University, which is now Imam Abdurrahman bin Faisal University. And the first Bachelor of Architectural program was established, established at either Iffat or Dar al-Hikmah, or at the same time, I believe, so, uh, in, in brief, I mean, we are in the presence of uh, pioneering institutions here in women education. Thank you so much. Um, now we will um, have the pleasure to listen to S Dr. Sumaya Sleiman. She will talk to us eye to eye, heart to heart, about the reflections on architectural and design education. Please. Thank you all. Um, again, I would like to thank uh, the Dar al Uloom Initiative, uh, Jawahar Steri in particular, everybody who's been organizing uh, this wonderful event and bringing um, all these great minds together. It's a real pleasure. Um, my talk today is more about the reflections in general. When I saw the title of what I was supposed to be talking about, um, well, it's huge. And I think it's a really big responsibility, but one of the things I wanted to do is kind of put a little bit of an overarching concept on top of it. And that is the idea of communication, dialogue, and discourse. Now, my PhD is all about architectural discourse. It's all about uh, the architecture of Saudi Arabia in general. 
But what we usually see is that you have this divide between what is traditional vernacular architecture and then, you know, that which we make grand, which we romanticize about. And then we have, you know, the dirty now, which is the contemporary. We don't talk about it because it's kind of this thing which we are sometimes ashamed about. And it's this dichotomy between these two ideas of what we were once proud of and then shamed, ashamed by, and then maybe actually even converting, that really creates a sort of tension that we need to address when it comes to education. Because our contemporary practices need to be grounded in something which is far stronger and more positive than shame. It needs to be grounded in something that is more than just, you know, the function of what we need to do. So my idea here today is that there are three things that I really want to touch upon. The first one is uh, architectural history and theory, or even if you remove the part architectural, you know, let's just talk history. I have students who when I ask about, you know, when was the establishment of Saudi Arabia, they just look at each other. That is a shame. Who knows the history of our country? It's not just that, you know, we are here, we are getting the education, we are following through these footsteps. We actually need to know where we're coming from. We need to ground our practice in all of these rich uh, cultural uh, pursuits that have come before. We cannot just kind of, you know, keep repeating from zero and then go on. The problem with that is that there is no continuous dialogue. And in the absence of that dialogue, then we really do not have much that we can talk about. Our discourse, the architectural discourse, is sadly mostly generated in the West. We have Western architects coming. They you know, design based on whatever um, either rudimentary plans or sometimes even very deep researches that they do, but then the problem is that they take all this knowledge with them. They have the technical know-how, but very limited ideas about what we need in a sort of a societal, cultural manner. And then you get to the point where they leave, take that experience with them, and we go and do the cycle over and over again. Where do we come into play? The architectural discourse is, is made of, of what? The buildings themselves? These are statements. They are made, they're also made of, of anything that has been written. How many architectural historians do we have? And is there really, you know, that kind of talk that goes back and forth, debate? The lack of criticism is, again, a very sad reality of what we have. We are able to talk about buildings in a way that should not just be a matter of do I like it, do I not like it, and then make up these minds based on something that is very simplistic. We need to go a little bit deeper and allow ourselves these discussions because it's only then that you know, we go beyond the building, beyond the physical, that we are able then to kind of generate meaning and this narrative that we you know, so badly crave. So that's the part about the architectural history and the theory. And then comes something which I have lots and lots of debates about with our students. It's this aspect of, you know, the digital, you know, flashy, CAD, Rivet. You have all these plugins. You know, you can produce something wonderful. Yes, wow. Um, what comes before is actual design. Our language that we communicate in is actually the language of drawing. You do not need to be an artist to communicate an idea, even if it is just you know, a very simple idea. But it's the beginning of a dialogue. Architecture is sometimes um, you know, put out as you know, it's this lone pursuit of the mega architect, the star architect. It's the vision of one person. You know, that's kind of the lone ranger idea of it. But when it comes down to it, the practice of architecture takes a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of back and forth. And if we do not start at the beginning where all of these designs come to play and we communicate in terms of that language very early on, then you know, we're losing something. It's not about the images that we produce in the end. It is really how we created them and how we came to get them. So that's the second part. Now, the third part is the idea of the real versus the imagined. So Dr. Shireen has been, you know, you really gave a lot about the, the real, and I totally agree. The real cannot be, you know, imagined in that sense, because it is only when we kind of get to the point where we need this kind of shock. It's easy to be, you know, in this architectural bubble where, you know, you have this elitist view of what the world should be, 
But on the ground, there's also, you know, you have to actually admit that there is a popular view of architecture that you just cannot go and dismiss completely. You have to engage with it in a certain way and then kind of elevate people's aesthetic values and tastes. So when you get to the point where you start talking about real projects and you engage with them, that's really the time where actual learning happens. And I like the part that you talked about when it came to reflection. What did you learn? Because usually we do one thing, we move on to the next, and we do not build on these experiences. But when it comes to real life projects, they go really, really deep. You cannot escape you know, the lessons that you learn. And if you're really open and honest about what can happen, there's a great treasure to be had. Now, you talked a lot about the social aspect of it because you, know, you go to the people who may not have access to architects, planners, designers in general. But we have to think about architecture also and design in general, about you know, a top-down vision and then also a bottom-up. And usually the top-down kind of creates what we call you know, the identity of a nation, this kind of aspect of nation building, where we want to think about a place in a, under a certain umbrella where anything that does not fit this really nice image that we have in our mind is just put aside and say, oh, no, no, that, that's not part of us. So when you look at Riyadh, for instance, you have in the discourse a very you know, limited number of buildings which barely scratch the surface of the numbers that are there. So how do you define what is architecture and what is not? How do you say that this is something that is sanctioned by the nation, that this relates to our identity? And the question again is, you know, what is our identity? We again have this top-down, bottom-up thing. If you look at people's houses, Everybody does things individually. You cannot say that this is not part of Saudi society. And then top down, you have something completely different. We have major shifts that are going on. And I actually saw some uh, ideas that, you know, with every king, we do have a little bit of a shift in architecture, how we view it and how certain values are embedded into it. And that's maybe something that could be explored a little bit more. Because as a nation, we are changing. And I think now, especially with lots of architectural students here, um, the idea is that you know, these are really, really exciting times. We are going you know, at full speed ahead, but I always have this idea of deja vu because what happened in the 70s and 80s was that yes, we completely imported things from the West and we abandoned everything that we had before. Then we had these cries, yes, we lost our identity, there's no continuity, we need to go back, and we had this struggle and tension, and then at some point, nobody really cared anymore. Things kind of balanced out. Now, we are again at some point where we are taking in a lot, but we need to question this. So that leaves me with, you know, maybe the last closing remark, which is students, and architects in general need to have an inquisitive mind. Anything you get exposed to, ask yourself lots and lots of questions about it. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumeya. That was inspiring, thank you. And on time too, thank you so much. Now, um, uh, we will all turn to Dr. Ziad Adam, who will be uh, speaking about um, thinking design, uh, an integrated approach to architectural education. Please. Well, I guess uh, it's tough to beat 10 minutes, uh, but uh, actually I have a story to tell, it's a short story of a long journey that I have. And I thank you all for giving me 10 minutes to tell it. Well, the world educated me in design and art, in business operation, and in evidence-based scientific research. I worked in the world of the private sector as a consultant, in the world of public sector, the government, as a client, and in the world of education sector as an assistant professor. However, 
These are just titles and job descriptions. They don't tell you who I am. And in this world, I saw the values that reflect profit over people, politics over service, grades over knowledge, class over humans, materialism over values, and knife over forks. It felt that the world is a play field for the survival of the fittest. This is a regression for me, a cultural shift from a society based on balance to a techno, capitalist, materialist, and operation-based society. So I embarked on a journey to understand. One, one day, I found an apple in my hand. But unlike Newton's apple and Stephen Jobs' apple, my apple fit in my hand for me to enjoy a real bite in enough portion to keep me fit. It is a perfect natural fit. This is design thinking by Fitra. So I, I, uh, so I arrived back to where I started from, to my own consciousness of the world, to being human with certain given capacities and intelligences with a clear center, to focus on what I believe is the core problem, thinking. So as a designer, I started to design my own thinking that fits. Then I came back to the world to see it in a different light. To see it as one net sphere of nested and entangled nodes, links, and circles that include the things events, and people of the world. And in this world, human-centric design is fitness for purpose. Well, uh, if you know David, Tom and Tom Kelly, the brothers, they told us that human-centric design is a design thinking approach or synthesis, which transcends and includes systems thinking or analysis. I thought about this for a long time. It took me three years in weekends in planes, in hotels, alone, and with friends. And one day, a word came my way. Synthesis. A word that transcends and includes synthesis, which transcends and includes analysis. Synthesis is my newly found good word Al-Kalima Tayyiba, in my good tree, Al-Shajara Al-Tayyiba, 
It means grow together. So I started as an integrator to apply my human-centric design in architectural education three weeks ago at Ifat University in Jeddah. But my quest started 17 years ago when at King Abdul Aziz University, I integrated architecture in a landscape architecture studio. And in Ifat in 2009, I integrated a course in Revit with a course in, with a studio in architectural design. And in 2012, at Dar al-Hikmah University, I integrated individual design with collective configuration. And as an instructor and a mentor, I repeated a mini lecture with my students as needed on ethics that starts with building on presence of the body, mind, and spirit, respect, which is built on the presence, and trust, which is earned after the respect and the presence. And my aim was and is to empower students as humans. It's the you, the I, to be creatively individual, to be creative individually, while integrate collectively in the we, in a fit way, or fitra way. So I set, set, uh, set out to promote a cultural shift from the survival of the fittest to the living of the fit. Thank you very much. very much Dr. Ziad on this very inspiring you know piece uh, actually you are the winner <laughs> you finished two minutes before your time second in command is Sumaya one minute and the bronze medalist uh, Dr. Shirin spot on ten minutes so this by far is the best panel a moderator could have um, now we will turn to the fourth speaker, which is the members of the audience. Uh, if, if you have any comments or questions, and uh, Dr. Sami, tawdal. I can barely see you, but because of the light. But uh, Bismillah. I think after hearing the three distinguished speakers we now very necessarily, and it's a necessity that we have to review and make our own teaching or learning instead of just importing. We can interact and integrate and take ideas and learn from those. But most important, I was yesterday in the Quality of Life studio, and we have more a lot of uh, very distinguished guests, young and older. But I think the most important thing is a chance that they seem to be, or we agree that they are advanced ahead of us. And they have had a lot of experience. So if we can try to learn, not only from their uh, advancement, but from what mistakes they made. So we don't repeat the same mistakes. Bani Adam is created to make mistakes. But if we make our own mistakes, that will be a very good start. So we should try and maybe fail and try and fail. A system is there. I don't mean now that we stop everything and try to find another solution. If we start to create a parallel line 
that will grow stronger and stronger and eventually in maybe a couple of years or maybe by 2030 that we, ha we will reach a, a level of what the distinguished speakers are talking and may I say especially Dr. Ziad with his very inspiring uh, apple and the use of the apple in a quite different way. I think we really have to dig in and see the experience. We talk about uh, education like in a university, in closed and defined space. And now there is a talk about distant education. But I think there is a, another kind of education which we learning that we have kind of forgotten or we have to bring it back, is education through apprenticeship. And there is a lot of people very uh, well like maybe, I don't know, I don't want to quote names, but there is many, even in the level of craftsmen or the level of architects or the level of great architects, that they can, that the student can interact and gain credit once they get uh, accepted and once they get cert uh, not certified, but ijaza uh, for a level of uh, learning, and that will feed into their program and crediting. And then eventually, we'll have a whole new way that we need to discover. Now we have done enough mistakes, copying other mistakes. Let's now, let's make our own mistakes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any member of the, would like to, Sumaya, I'll put you on the spotlight. You are a dean now, so. Okay, sure. um, okay. Uh, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, making our own mistakes. I think one thing personally that I uh, thought, I'm, I'm the A plus student, you know, the overzealous one, the person who always seeks answers, truths, things like that. And I think that in itself is a mistake because there's always, in a way, I'm not saying you shouldn't get A plus, it's very satisfying, but um, the idea is that, you know, there's no one truth. And that is what I thought I always looked for. There must be, you know, the right answer to this. Now, I started teaching in Saudi Arabia. When I did my PhD, I started teaching at Newcastle University. Very different approaches. And I think it was at that point where um, I did four years there, where I actually started totally changing how we think about design and architecture because there, it's a matter of open-ended questions. You do not necessarily have to claim that you have, you know, the final answer. You do not have the best solution. And it is okay. And in a way, for somebody like me, that is, in a way, a failure. Because, you know, I did not reach the ultimate goal. And letting go of that was so liberating, in a way. But it's also very infuriating to some of our students. Because they come to us with, you know, their designs and they say, so I know this doesn't work, what do I do now? Well, go figure it out. Well, give me the tools, so we talk about it. And then the student goes back and she comes back and says, well, she didn't do anything for me, you know, I did it all myself. And inside, I'm clapping, yes, you did it, because that's what we want. We want people who are able to solve it. It's not a matter of education that is imparted. It's not a set of knowledge that you give to somebody. This will go on. The technologies that have changed since I graduated until now, I would never be able to catch up or just say, you know, my undergraduate or even to the PhD, you know, that education was enough. If you're an architect, you continuously learn and you have to embrace that. So that in a way is for me, you know, this kind of revelation that you do not have to have all the answers. And really it's kind of in this ambiguity that you get the most discussion and debate and it becomes really, really interesting because instead of you taking ownership of that problem, you then allow others to pitch in. So. Uh, well, I, th I think the idea of the, uh, the, the West uh, uh, as, as dominating in terms of globalism and understanding and knowledge and technology and all of that is, is for, for us, is, uh, is, is just a source of, of knowledge and information and interaction and civilization and cultural uh, trans uh, uh, transfer. 
because uh, I'm, I'm sure many sitting in this room are actually uh, uh, graduates of uh, the, the West and they have the, the, the thinking tools that the West gave us. So, so the idea is that, uh, and as Dr. Sami is saying, it, it's time, uh, uh, if we're talking about Vision 2030 and, 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 and really unleashing the, the power and empower uh, the, 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 the society as a whole, it's time that we uh, 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 use our thinking tools that we have gained and uh, they're available here. The hypercubic is, is, uh, is, is, is a wonderful thing. It's already there. And, and we as, as gen this generation is in fact uh, empowered digitally at the same time the same generation in the entire world and in the West are empowered. And we have the same high Wi-Fi, high is the high intelligence Wi-Fi that we have to receive and send signals. So what's, what's left? It's just the will to power the, the, the collection, the, the, the congregations such as this, the gathering, the sharing, uh, uh, knowing uh, wonderful minds, uh, this is the idea of a conference. So I think it's time and it's happening. So uh, what, I, what, what shall I say? Uh, let's congratulate, congratulate ourselves in moving uh, uh, forward in, in, in the next phase of, of uh, our society, the new generation. Um, okay, I think uh, what I want to add is Noting what you already said is that I think we need to get out of our comfort zones. We get too used to our comfort zones. We are, when we stay local, that's what happens when you travel, even to travel abroad and study abroad. All of a sudden you find yourself out of your comfort zone. Let's even talk about not having your family support, not having your friends, not having the same traditions around you. And you find yourself for a, the first time you need to, to know who you are. Uh, whatever you took from home with you, you have to define what uh, who you are, and then you have to pass this knowledge, you know, acknowledge who you are as a person, and then learn from the West, not become part of the West. Sometimes you go abroad, and we see people that we study abroad, and they, you know, they want to mingle, they just want to disappear, and they want to be part of them. And some of others, no, they want to keep their identity, take the knowledge, learn about uh, whatever they have been offering us and then coming back and giving, passing this knowledge so that other people who was not very you know, successful going abroad or didn't have the same opportunity can say, can say that you know, we were exposed again to the same knowledge. I think that's our role also as educator. Um, being in the comfort zones um, for students, even as you said, as grades and Dr. Ziad, you mentioned something grades over knowledge. I think it's all, and, and you said something about a student, you know, you didn't give me the tools because they want the answers, but again, in the end of the day, they have to find the answers themselves. That's what you want to teach them, that, you know, you go there, you research, you find your own answers. I'm not going to give you the answers. Sometimes it's misinterpreted. They think that, you know, you're not good. I need to find it. I need to find someone else who will give me the answer. But then I think when you keep asking the right questions, maybe they can also find the right answers that you need. So this is another part of what we need to give the students. Teach them what questions they should ask. Teach them what they should uh, you know, ask, and then they will find the right uh, answer that they are seeking. Thank you very much for your responses all. Are there any other questions, like students maybe? Abdel Latif, tafadal. يعطيكم العافية جميعا عندي a couple of, of points وبعدين عندي سؤال uh, point الأولى uh, when we studied architecture since it's based on apprenticeship and actually the architects اللي حطيتهم أول شيء uh, at least two of whom I know the history of were apprentices ف this is why in higher education and in college architects are taught by practitioners not by PhD holders هذه شغلة أنا أشوفها يعني بجامعة الكويت. A PhD holder is, is, a, is a great source of information. بس يختلف عن a practitioner who's practicing architecture, architecture to teach architecture. So that's an important point I would like um, تحلقون عليها. The second is, is Dr. Sami, you mentioned making our own 
mistakes. And this is a, an amazing concept. Uh, you've mentioned is architectural critique. I don't know if you're in Saudi Arabia, but we're going to talk a lot about it. Critique is, is a very sensitive word. So, what is the meaning that we can do and we know that we're going to do it? The problem is that we're going to do it. We're making our own mistakes. But no one is raising the flag and saying, this is a mistake. But again, architectural critique and how you construct that in a professional manner is very important for the advancement of education and architecture as a profession, which at least we lack. So I would like to know your thoughts about that. Shukran. Okay. Um, so what kind of environment can criticism thrive in? To be honest, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm a member of the municipal council also, so I deal with the municipalities, I deal with all the pe different people, and you see systematic failures everywhere in the provision of services, things like that. And the minute somebody asks for a service and it happens just because a specific person asked for it, Everybody comes out and claps, oh yes, you did such a great job, this is what you always do, you're wonderful, and so on. Yes, we're grateful this happened, but this does not solve our problems. I think maybe, even now, instead of, you know, a critique in a, in a way is very scary. I think even for students going through crits, juries, whatever you call them, uh, there's always an aspect that it's negative. But in education, we always look at things that are either formative or summative. So let's say the midterm jury is actually a formative assessment where I'm giving you points and feedback to make your design better. In the summative, it's done, it's over, that's it. I'm giving you the summary of it. You're probably not gonna benefit much unless you know it's just a lesson learned, I'm gonna put this in a note somewhere and maybe forget about it. The problem is that we ourselves, I mean, going back to the comfort zone, are not in a place where we can create a space where we say, this is a non-threatening environment where I can actually share what I have and be vulnerable in a sense. Because we always have this image of the architect, you know, the Superman who comes in, of, you know, he knows best, he has the vision, and I'm using he, but that is totally wrong, I should say she. Um, so, yeah, but you know, it, it goes both ways. And I think maybe we ourselves now can start critiquing some of the buildings in a way that does not necessarily have to really totally engage. But we need to start creating forums where we come together and discuss things. It doesn't have to be critique in the negative sense, but you know, critique in how do I understand this? Where does this lie in history? Is this, you know, a positive or a negative point in our cultural production? What do we understand for, about this form? Certain things that maybe can start in universities where we put them under the educational umbrella, but then maybe they expand. But I think, you know, really people who are engaged coming together and not just two or three people who are writing articles. There is a professor of architecture, a professor, who wrote an article in a newspaper and he had this preamble at the beginning. I'm giving an opinion about a building, although nobody asked me to give this opinion. But because this is my specialization and because I feel responsible in a way, that's why I'm giving it. Does a professor of architecture really need to put this kind of introduction when he comes to write about architecture? That's the problem with it. And I think, you know, until we get to the point where it's not, you know, if, if I say something that you might say is critical of something that you produced, if I think this will negatively impact me in my career in the future, I will probably not say it. That's the kind of environment. And until this, um, there's more transparency in how things are done and not just by the way that we know people and we get these things done through our connections, maybe then we can get to that point. I, don't, I hope this answers the question in a way. I would like to add something, I think, to the point uh, you mentioned about practitioner. I totally believe this point. However, I also need to add that not all uh, practitioners, not everyone is a teacher. Not everyone can teach. You meet lots of designers that are great, but then when they speak and, you know, some, some of them, they don't know how to, to transfer their knowledge. Some of them, they don't want to transfer their knowledge. 
Some people are so, um, sometimes they are so selfish that, you know, they want to keep the knowledge for themselves. Uh, some, some of them, they don't know how to teach, how to transfer. Y you attend, I attended lectures for great, you know, architects, practitioners who have done really good buildings in Egypt, for example. But then you sit in the class and you're bored and uh, you're sleepy and you're not, uh, he's not catching your attention. So yes, practitioners is very important, and I totally believe the experience should be translated through a practitioner who knows and who knows the how dos and everything. But also, he has to be a good teacher, uh, not only. Uh, and that's how you find a great teacher. Sometimes people who are practitioners could be good teachers to people, you know, to the school of architecture, for example, to other people, to so people who worked with them. They can be good teachers, even though they are not actually teachers or PhD holders. Uh, so that's what I wanted to add. Would you um, like just to make it yeah, really just snappy Yeah, just a, a, a quick uh, follow-up on uh, your question. Uh, well, critical thinking, criticism, critique, crit, they, they're all part of the architectural uh, culture, uh, the, the culture of the studio. Uh, but the, 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 the issue here is how you create the environment, the healthy environment, for the students to apply criticism. Uh, I think uh, I can say that I'm trying in, uh, it's still an experiment in, uh, in uh, effort, um, I'm, I'm teaching studios seven and eight and uh, research methods, and I'm saying that uh, criticism is a two-way uh, path, uh, and, and, and this mini lecture that I built on the presence of the students and myself, and the respect and the trust is actually uh, mutual. So, so I stop and say to them, uh, what do you think? Uh, do you like uh, this uh, thinking tool, how we are moving? And they crit criticize it. And, and, and I actually, uh, of course, they're scared because they think that uh, under a dictatorial uh, uh, style, uh, I will, uh, I will uh, uh, yeah, give bad grades to those who criticize. So I'll just tell them now who has something uh, to, uh, critical to say to me so that I can move forward. And, and you hear things. Once they trust you that you are um, creating this studio uh, culture. Uh, shukran. Uh, uh, just to have a clarification, because I said this, uh, referencing to the Quran and our teaching, it says, uh, So, and in the other uh, teaching, it says, uh, When we you glimpsed or just mentioned the word mizan or balance, I think this is something very important uh, that we have to have a long discussion about. Is once you talk about balance, then you talk about reference. So we have to establish to be able to have a, a very clear criticism or discussion on wrong and right. We have to really establish the reference. What are we talking about? And then that will help everybody, uh, students, teachers. So if you have a fixed point of reference, which is very, very part of the whole universal order, that you have a reference. So we have to establish a reference that you can use for measuring things. As a, as a benchmark, you mean? Uh, not a benchmark, it's a reference. Something that yeah. you can learn from, and somebody will say, I think this and this, say, well, based on what? Science could be a good reference also, but also our uh, uh, in, inner feeling is another reference. And the other one is the, the book, the book that we have that can give us a fantastic reference, and that's a long discussion we, we need. Sure. It's not modern architecture or traditional architecture. It is balanced architecture. That's what I want to say. Architecture of balance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sami. Uh, I think Ala. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ala Tarabzouni. I'm an architect and an educator. Well, I have a question, um, question addressing your notion on criticism, Dr. Samaya. Um, I guess my question is, and I address this to the entire panel, what do you think your biggest criticism of uh, education or architecture education in Saudi is? Or, uh, maybe a segue or a way into that question is your idea of the nature of the internship or the relationship of education to the licensure position, uh, 
uh, the licensure uh, um, uh, procedures in uh, in the kingdom. Um, sorry, could you repeat the beginning of the second question? Sure. The uh, relationship between education, mm -hmm. of uh, architecture education, and then the procedure of getting your license uh, to practice in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, we seem to copy a lot of, uh, or uh, education is very Western, um, but then it stops at the procedure of the license, if, if you have any comments about that. Okay. Um, so I'll start with the first part. Um, so criticism. Um, Maybe the biggest problem is that, yes, our education is completely um, Western, or at least that's how it started. We're kind of trying to infuse um, our curricula with a little bit of a, the local, but it's not there yet. Um, the criticism at this point touches upon what you talked about, which is the relationship between practice and architecture. Because when you go to the office, you know, the environment is completely different, the requirements are um, totally changed. You do not have the space to have these lofty ideas anymore. But my criticism of the architectural education, I think, is also that it does not engage with the current practice that is now happening. So for instance, we have lots and lots of projects that are going on. So much experience is being generated. Just, you know, they're neighbors. We have all these big companies coming in. I'll give you a very short story of what happened in the 70s and uh, the 80s. So, in the 70s, you had all these Western architects coming into Saudi Arabia, delivering. Some of them actually coming in with projects and they're just saying, you know, this is my project, does anybody want to buy it? They were coming to institutions unsolicited because, you know, with the recession and the depression around the world, it was really in the 70s and the oil boom that, you know, Saudi Arabia and the, the Gulf region in general had all this money to, to really go ahead with modernization and the infrastructure. It got so bad that the Saudi architects did not find a place. Now, obviously, we were talking uh, previously just about engineers and architects. So the Saudi architect is, um, I'll say, you know, the black duck in a way, because the architect, the Saudi architect, came late to the game. The engineer came before him. So the architect couldn't really find the proper share. You had engineers encroaching on those limits. And then, what happened was the Western architect came in, and then the Saudi architect, you know, didn't really find a place anymore. At that point in 1976, there was a royal decree. Every Western consultant needed to have a Saudi partner. Now, this, in a way, should solve the problem, but it didn't. Because all of these partnerships became just, you know, something on paper. You had the Saudis doing the administration work, and then you had the Westerners doing the projects, and very little transfer was going on. There are some really good examples where, for instance, somebody like Trevor Dannett, who designed the uh, Intercontinental Hotel and Conference Center, uh, won the competition, uh, and he came. So there were some lectures that were given at King Saud University at the time. Kenzo Tange also, you know, he came, he did the Khairiya Complex, one and two, and he came and gave lectures. But the the relationship between practicing architects here and now, actually doing real projects and education, you know, there's so much potential that is untapped. And I think maybe that is the biggest shortcoming that we have in education. We may have, you know, very short lectures, but actually going to the site, talking to people, and really seeing how are these things being created in our backyards with us, you know, just as bystanders. I think that's a little sad. The licensing part, to be honest, I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert on. I wouldn't really be able the, the to talk about. The next panel will, will but, address yeah. this. But unless stick somebody around, here wants you know, to. the next panel will speak about the licensing uh, systems, imported and homegrown. Mohandas Abdelilah. Bismillah ar-Rahim. Abdelilah al-Sheikh. I'm an expert in urban development. Uh, neither am I an engineer or an, uh, an architect, but I get the always the notion people thinking that I'm an architect uh, through my exposure. Uh, in the past 25 years being in this field, uh, I, I share with you this concern that uh, how do we relate or bring in uh, the Saudi homegrown thinking into our uh, architecture, planning, urban design uh, processes uh, today, uh, even though we are importing lots of the, uh, I mean, international firms into our projects. Uh, I'm very concerned about this. I always have been champion of bringing in students, working with universities. Uh, I've not succeeded till today. Uh, at least we got one master's degree in urban management in KSU this year through MOMRA, 
So I think that I have participated in some way. But I think we have a new wave, as you were talking, of development coming. I think there's another layer of development of cities, and I believe there's a huge opportunity to create these uh, linkages, bringing in students and practitioners uh, and uh, academics into the practitioner field. Uh, and I would be very happy to discuss this. I'm now exposed to many projects, and I really want to work with both, I mean, Hikmet and uh, uh, maybe F at the universities, Faisal, King Saud. Uh, it would be very much of an honor to do that and to see our, our young people coming into this field and making the mistakes and learning from it, as, as uh, our, I mean, uh, we, has been said in the panel. But thank you very much for, for this uh, insight because we want to create the bridge between the practitioners and the academics and our students, which we have to hand over all this responsibility to in the future. So thank you to all. Th thank you very much for your comment. The next panel will, will be about uh, professional practice. So they will be able to tell you how it looks like you know, on the other side of the, of the tunnel. Uh, I think we are over time now, so I would like to thank my uh, co-panelists here and thank the members of the audience for their questions and comments. And um, there is no way to really conclude uh, this discussion, but um, I think everybody agrees or it's embedded in every, uh, in every talk and in every comment that the best uh, sustainable um, uh, skill is uh, an inquisitive mind and a liberated will to create. Thank you all so much. <laughs>